Welcome to The Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James A. Janice, and today we're looking at Evil Dead 2, released in 1987. This is probably the most iconic installment of the franchise, and the one that gives Evil Dead its reputation. Although it retains most of the schlocky gore from the original, it adds a ton of slapsticky screwball humor, expertly performed by Bruce Campbell, who's got some amazing physical comedy chops. This change in tone was partly thanks to Scott Spiegel, a childhood friend of Sam Raimi's, with whom he had made several short films growing up in Michigan. Spiegel co-wrote the script with Raimi and felt like the sequel would benefit from a more comedic tone than the original. And he was totally right, the comedy is what helped make this movie so successful. The change in tone also helps with one of the more peculiar aspects of this movie, the fact that half of it is kind of a remake of the original. Raimi and producer Robert Tapper ran into an issue early on when New Line Cinema wouldn't give them the rights of the first Evil Dead to use in a sort of recap segment in the second one. So they decided to spend the first 15 minutes of Evil Dead 2 basically remaking the first movie, up to an including the very last cliffhangery shot. Sure, they par down the characters from five friends to just a single couple, and they run through everything a whole lot quicker, but it's still the same storyline, lending a very weird continuity to these movies that you shouldn't try to overthink, because they just don't make sense as one long continuous story. Also, you may notice that there are no ads on this video, but for once it's a good thing, because today's episode is brought to you by Loot Fright, an all-new subscription service by Loot Crate that delivers a crate full of horror stuff right to your door every other month. Each crate has at least four horror items, inside, and the previous one included this awesome Evil Dead figurine set that's helping to decorate my background there. Next month's crate is themed Season's Grievings, which will not only bring you some holiday fear, but also include some Lovecraftian items. To get that Fright Crate, order by November 15th at 9pm by going to LootCrate.com slash DeadMeat. You'll also get 15% off your first crate. That's LootCrate.com slash DeadMeat. Use that promo code DEADMEAT, y'all! Thanks for the support, Loot Fright. Now let's get to the kills. The movie begins with a voiceover hyping up the audience for the Necronomicon Ex Mortis. Roughly translated, Book of the Dead. Yeah, that's a hungry, hungry book. We get a Twilight Zone spiral of spooky stuff and a fun red sea of blood that the narrator says was used to ink the book. And after we learn that the book disappeared in the year 1300 AD, we get ourselves a good old-fashioned title card. In this stripped-down retelling of the original film, the only people in the Delta 88 are Ash and his girlfriend Linda. So what's this place like? Well, it's a little run down. Denise Bixler plays Linda now, replacing Betsy Baker from the original because she was pregnant when they made the sequel. Ash and New Linda cross a giant bridge and wind up at the cabin, where he serenades her on the piano and she dances for him like a beautiful Spartan ballerina. She's already equipped with a magnifying glass necklace, so yeah, we're just blown straight through the first movie's plot. I'm not entirely sure how they wound up at this cabin, but it definitely wasn't through Airbnb. What if the people who own this place come home? They're not gonna come back. What? This is just straight up B&E now? Ash decides to desecrate this stranger's house even more with some champagne-fueled sexy time, so then he finds a tape player that he can't help but listen to. On the tape is the voice of Professor Raymond Noby, talking about how he went to the ruins of Kandar with his wife Henrietta, his daughter Annie, and an associate professor named Ed. Together, they all discovered a familiar fleshy book. Now that book's here, looking way better than it did in the first movie. And once again, the professor's voice on the tape recites an incantation that gets a spirit outside the cabin all riled up. So riled up, it's ready to bash its way through through another window. Ash follows Linda's scream to find her missing from her room, so he goes outside to look for her. He finds her shortly. <laughs> Looks like we've got another possession kill, and in record time, too. We're only six minutes in, and already Ash's new old girlfriend is a screaming, giggling deadite. We get a repeat of the flying deadite and shovel decapitation, with similar shots but better effects, and after Ash buries Linda and marks her grave with a cross, we tie up the previously on Evil Dead segment by getting another version of that final shot from the first movie. But this time, it continues after Ash gets hit by the evil spirit. It's a real fun trip as he spun around in the quote-unquote Sam Cam shot, until eventually he smacks into a tree and lands face down in a puddle. When he comes back up for air, we see that Ash is now a deadite. What? <laughs> How is Bruce Campbell still handsome with all that shit on his face? Lucky for Mr. Williams, the sun comes out and clears his skin up like a healthy dose of Accutane. And once again, just gotta show off some of the great directorial work of Sam Raimi. What a fun shot that was. Unfortunately, it looks like the sun god didn't clear out every last evil spirit. <laughs> Oh, back on this shit again? I swear, man, Deadites sound like a damn pyramid scheme. Ash tries to drive the classic straight on out of there, but gets stopped by a familiar-looking bridge claw telling him to hold his horses. Oh, no. No. No! 
The sun sets behind Ash super fast, and our hero finds himself in a reverse-driven car chase trying to get away from the evil spirit POV shot. He makes it back to the cabin, where we get my single favorite shot from the entire series, the evil spirit chasing Ash around in an extended as hell chase scene throughout various rooms in the cabin. I'm amazed by Bruce Campbell and whoever's opping that camera every time I watch this. How are they not hitting their heads on all the beams and pipes in these tight-ass crawl spaces? Holy shit. Eventually, the evil spirit loses track of Ash and just reverses itself on out of the cabin, retreating back into the woods and calling it quits for now. Oh, the old hiding in the cellar trick. Good call, Ash. After he gets out of the cellar, he finds the piano playing on its own, and with that sentimental music and the magnifying glass necklace in his pocket, he thinks of Linda too and becomes a downright blubbery boy. Don't worry, Ash. Linda's like the Looney Tunes and back in action. Or I guess she's in more of a Corpse Bride style animation than traditional 2D, but look at her go. She knows all the latest dance moves, the reheading roll, the fancy standing crunch, the not breaking eye contact body spin. Linda could win admission to Tan's Academy, no problem. She appears in front of the window to grab at Ash's face, but after her head falls off, he finds himself screaming by himself in a chair. You okay, Ash? Is all this shit even happening for reals? <laughs> yeah, it is, cause they're ahead in your lap. Hello, lover. <laughs> Another wacky Bruce Campbell sequence follows, where he bashes Linda's disembodied head all around the cabin before coming up with a better idea. Work shed. Just, uh, one more awesome pratfall from Bruce before he gets there. This dude's physical comedy is top freaking notch, man. When he gets to the work shed, oh hey, there's a Freddy Krueger glove hanging up there. He puts Linda's head in a vice while she continues to taunt him. Even now we have your darling Linda soul. Then her body busts in waving a chainsaw around, but Ash uses a crowbar to knock the tool right back into the corpus animatus, where it begins a body bifurcation in earnest. After the body falls to the ground, Ash wrestles the chainsaw, and, um, the arm, from it to use on his former girlfriend. And in one last trolling maneuver, the severed head reverts to Linda's human form to plead for mercy. I love you! But it doesn't keep up the ruse for long, and Ash takes the chainsaw to the dead-eyed skull, sawing it in half in silhouette against the wall. The off-screen nature of this kill is because Sam Raimi didn't want to repeat all the censorship and obscenity charges that happened with the first Evil Dead. But if you want to see this chainsaw trick on screen, just hang tight till the remake. You won't be disappointed. Back inside the cabin, Ash trades out his power tool for a boomstick he found on the wall, then goes to check his sanity in the mirror. While the first movie had that cool water mirror effect, this one has something neater. We just cut up our girlfriend with a chainsaw. Does that sound... Bye. Mirror Ash starts choking real life Ash, or at least causes him to choke himself, and next thing you know, Ash's hand is getting an evil speared henna tattoo. Yeah, I'm neither an old priest nor a young priest, but uh, I think you got a possessed hand there, buddy. <laughs> In the kitchen, Ash's hand begins to attack his head with a series of plate smashes and countertop bashes. Shit, the best stunt though is when it flips him onto the ground. Bruce, you are killing it, dude! And yeah, in case you had any doubts, this is all Bruce Campbell doing his own stunts. The guy is just incredible in this movie. The hand starts to crawl its way over to a meat cleaver to inflict maximum damage against its passed out owner, but Ash stops it with a sudden knife stab that pins it to the ground. Who's laughing now? And he's not done yet, cause he grabs the conveniently nearby chainsaw to finally put an end to this metacarpal possession. Throughout all this, Annie Noby, daughter of the archaeologist who recorded the tape in the cabin, has arrived back home from an expedition wherein she was able to find some missing pages from the Book of the Dead. She and that associate professor, Ed, who she's also shacking up with, head to her father's cabin to meet up with him and translate the pages, only to find that their way is blocked by the torn up bridge claw. She's told there's no way to get to the cabin by this dude Jake and his rough and tumble, spittin' mumbling girlfriend Bobby Joe, a character played by Cassie Wesley but based on Holly Hunter. Holly Hunter actually lived with Ramey and Spiegel while they wrote the this movie, and you know who was also in the house? Oh, just the Coen brothers, Francis McDormand, and Kathy frickin' Bates, what? Jake and Bobby Joe soon change their tune and say they'll show them a way to the cabin for a hundred bucks. You take my bags and you got a deal. Sure. <laughs> the joke ends up being on Jake, though, since Annie's bags include a giant bestickered trunk that he has to carry on his back. Back at the cabin, Ash's hand is now separate but equally possessed, so he settles with simple entrapment to keep it in place. Here's your new home. 
great visual gag by Spiegel here, with Ash putting farewell to arms on top of the bucket for weight. But after he takes care of his wound with some duct tape, he finds the bucket tipped over and the hand escaped. He sees it crawling away and being quite vulgar to his former body host, but after shooting into the wall and landing what he thinks to be a hit, Ash is dismayed to find out that it's just a demonic geyser of blood that sprays out of the hole and soaks him through and through. There's blood everywhere, just like you want to see in an Evil Dead movie, until it turns into black bile and retreats back into the wall. Ash tries to take a seat, only for the chair to break under his weight. And if that wasn't embarrassing enough, it turns out someone in the cabin saw it and found it fucking hilarious. <laughs> The gas line must be leaking here, because every damn item in the cabin is having an uproarious fit of the giggles. It doesn't take long for Ash to catch the laughing bug too, which is only made more awesome when he gets into a dance-off with the desk lamp. Oh. But his laughing turns into howls of pain, and a noise outside causes him to fire his shotgun at the door, finally putting an end to the cabin giggle good times. Turns out he was shooting at Annie and the others, since Jake tackles him to the ground and, with Ed's help, knocks him out. Annie enters last and sees the bloody chainsaw on the ground, then shakes Ash like a Joy-Con because she thinks that he's a crazed murderer who killed her parents. They kick Ash down into the root cellar for safekeeping, and I just realized how we haven't really seen the cellar explored yet in this movie. The first two Evil Deads really start to get mixed up in my head after a while. To get more facts, Annie goes to the tape, where she hears her father say that her mother Henrietta became possessed and tried to kill him. In response, he had to kill her. I could not bring myself to dismember her corpse. I buried her in the cellar. God help me, I buried her in the earthen floor of the fruit cellar. Here's Henrietta! This terrifying villainess was played by Sam Raimi's younger brother Ted, who did not have a fun time in the really warm full-body latex suit he had to wear. So Ted, how does it feel to be stuck in that costume all day? I guess that, it's inexplicable. It's beyond your wildest that nightmares. Wild. <laughs> Apparently, having to wear that thing around also left him pretty hungry. I'll swallow your soul! <laughs> Ash is saved by Henrietta's appetite by the others, who pull him up out of the cellar. They all get assaulted by the Henrietta deadite. Henry Detta? Hmm, maybe. And when Ash tries to shove her into the cellar, Henrietta's eyeball pops out and flies right into Bobby Joe's screaming mouth. Certainly gross, but you can see how this movie is more slapsticky than the original. After a bit of a struggle, the guys are finally able to chain the door shut, giving them a temporary end to their Henrietta problem. Ash catches them up on all the forced fun times he's been having, and stops Annie from unlocking the cellar door when the Henrietta deadite tries to mom her way into Annie's heart. Good save, y'all. Oh, but now we've got an Ed Deadite. Edite? Definitely. And this Edite is quite the theatrical one. We are the things that were and shall be again. He even leads a chorus with Henrietta chanting this movie's tagline. Get back down! Get back down! Great possession, Ed. Good stuff. I especially like when he air thrillers over to Bobby Joe and bites her in the hair. Mmm, Pantene Plus. Ash is sick and tired of dealing with Deadites, so he charges Evil Ed with an axe and cuts off part of his head. Again, the silhouette style kill and swapping out the red blood for what appears to be green goo was an attempt at getting an R rating instead of anything worse. It didn't work though, and ultimately, the movie was released unrated. We live the four remaining cabin dwellers gather around in the corner and get assaulted by lots of skewed camera angles and heavy-handed sound design. <laughs> They then move into another room where they're tormented with stuff falling down and Pazuzu screaming at them. Oh wait, that's not Pazuzu. Father? Annie. That's Papa Archaeologist, and his floating head tells them that their salvation lies in the missing Necronomicon pages that Annie brought with her. Okay, thanks Dad, bye! With Professor Noby's exit, we have room for another beloved side character to make its return. Holding my hand too tight. Baby, I ain't holding your hand. Does that mean? Yeah, it's Mr. Han taking a break from disciplining Spicoli to scare Bobby Joe straight on out of the cabin. Yeah, that girl be gone. She ends up face to face with an evil Wizard of Oz tree, and in no time at all starts getting attacked by vines and tree branches. They do tear some of her clothes, but like I said, Sam Raimi had come to regret the scene with Cheryl in the original, so he doesn't redo that sequence here. Instead, Bobby Joe is dragged through the woods in a couple of big puddles, all while getting her face stabbed by vines, until her forest floor death drag finally ends with an off-screen collision with a tree. Back in the cabin, when Annie and Ash examine the missing pages closer, they find a drawing of a blue-clad figure raising a chainsaw triumphantly in the air. In 1300 AD, they called this man the hero from the sky. 
Hell yeah, they did. Do I smell a three cool anyone? But they're not looking for a medieval fantasy horror film right now. They just want the spell that'll end this onslaught of deadites. All this mumbo jumbo sounds like a bunch of nerd shit to Jake, who turns the shotgun on them in order to make them go look for Bobby Joe in the woods. And to further haze these geeks, he throws their dorky book pages into the cellar. Now move! They go outside, and Jake starts screaming into the trees for Bobby Joe, attracting the attention of that classic first-person Evil Dead spirit. But it bypasses Jake, and instead finds a home in our devilishly handsome hero. Evil Ash tosses Jake into a tree, and then chases Annie into the cabin, where he tells her, Uncle Sam-style, that he wants her. She shuts the door on that opportunity, and while he's traipsing around outside, she arms herself with the Kandarian dagger. Real talk, Annie's a badass. When she sees the cabin door a jiggling, Annie steps back and lies in wait for her attacker, then jumps out with a dagger strike when they walk inside. But it's Jake that she just stabbed, who's, yeah, kind of an asshole, but not a deadite, so, uh, whoops. She pulls the dagger out of him, which, like, not sure you're supposed to do that, then tries to drag him to a safer spot in the cabin. She sets him down so she can grab the axe, but that's when Henrietta deadite pops up from the cellar, and she is is hungry! Annie tries with all her might to keep Jake from being dragged below ground, but she loses that tug-of-war fight, and Jake is killed in a fantastically ridiculous way, with another geyser of bright red blood spewing out of the cellar and covering Annie. It's so absurd. This is some biblical levels of blood. I love it. Evil Ash is inside the house now, but after he lifts Annie up over his head and throws her into a wall, he finds that magnifying glass necklace on the ground and can't help but pick it up. Evil Ash is reduced to some very gross-sounding tears that are probably gonna fuck up all that makeup on his face. But maybe that's for the best. The hero we know and love is back, and we can finally admire that chiseled jaw uninhit- Whoa, watch the axe! As Annie is back up and ready to save herself from Evil Ash. He tells her the evil is gone, and although she doesn't believe him at first, he eventually convinces her. <laughs> In order to get those Necronomicon pages from the cellar, they go out to the work shed to prep themselves for the final confrontation. This is when Ash is finally outfitted with his iconic chainsaw hand that he immediately uses to give himself a sawed-off shotgun, which, uh, let's see here. Oh, yeah, <clears throat> has a shorter effective range due to a lower muzzle velocity. However, its reduced length makes it easier to maneuver and conceal. Groovy. Thanks, I just looked it up on Wikipedia. Ash heads down into the cellar and towards the back room, where there's another Freddy Krueger glove hanging on the wall. Sam Raimi included the gloves as an homage to Wes Craven, who, after seeing the poster for The Hills Have Eyes in the original Evil Dead, repaid the favor by having Nancy watch The Evil Dead in the original Nightmare on Elm Street. Don't you just love how tight-knit and supportive our little horror community is? In the back room, Ash runs into the spoopy skeleton of Jake, which he has to move aside to get the missing pages of the Necronomicon. His mission accomplished, he goes back to the stairs and gives the pages to Annie. But before he himself can escape, he gets tripped by Henrietta. How's it hanging, Ash? Annie starts her recitation, but gets interrupted interrupted by the sound of Ash getting his ass kicked downstairs. Then Henrietta jumps on up and grabs Annie by the hair as she tries to flee. Henrietta spins her around while floating in the air, laughing her crazy deadite laugh until Ash Williams drags himself out of the basement and gets ready to kick some witch ass. Also, hey, want to see something gross? So like I mentioned before, Sam Raimi's younger brother Ted played Henrietta and would sweat his friggin' balls off in the full body suit he had to wear. You might be wondering where all that sweat went. Well, usually they'd empty it from the feet of the costume at the end of the day. Gross. But sometimes it would come out the ear during shoots, like right there. That's just a lot of Ted Raimi sweat pouring out that ear. Aw, oh, sick. That might be grosser than anything else in this movie, which is saying something. Ash and Henrietta have their wrestling match, complete with elbow blows and Henrietta selling some great heel rage before she transforms fully into a crazy special effects creature with a long ass neck. She attacks Ash while making monkey noises, landing at least one headbutt, but after Annie temporarily distracts her with a lullaby, Ash is is finally able to kill the Henrietta Deadite by taking his chainsaw hand and hacking off all her limbs. The headless body deflates with a loud fart noise and falls to the ground, but Ash still needs to put the final nail in the coffin. Swallow this. <laughs> Awesome. Ash and Annie share a friendship hug, but then the trees outside turn into walloping willows and pound the crap out of the cabin with their branches. This place has got an expressway passage to Destructionville, because apparently Annie only finished the part of the incantation that embodies the evil spirit in the woods. And here it is! This spooky blurry creature face gives Ash some Littlefinger-esque silver temples, and although Annie tries to finish the incantation to trap the spirit in a wormhole or whatever, she suddenly stops mid-sentence, because turns out she's got a dagger in her back. Curtis 
courtesy of one Mr. Ash's hand. But the hand wasn't right to have left her for dead, because before she dies, Annie is able to finish her recital like a kid trying to impress their parents, and her final words successfully open up the portal. Too bad with that, she dies. You were cool, Annie. Ash is having some major troubles with the Beast of the Forest, which is pulling him out of the cabin, and whose various mini-heads start cheering that they've won. Victory is ours! Ash tries to dispel that theory by sticking his chainsaw in the monster's eye, as the wormhole outside sucks down the classic Oldsmobile and various trees. Eventually, it captures the beast itself, but Ash gets less than a moment of peace because pretty soon, the door to the cabin flies off, and Ash too is sucked out of the building and into the wormhole. He goes through a Stargate sequence full of Christmas lights and fireworks before he and his car end up dropping into a locale that seems a bit more dusty and barren than the evil woods. That's because this movie just got medieval on our ass. It's 1300 AD, and and these knights in not-so-shining armor think that Ash is an evil being himself. Before they can close on the execution, though, a shrieking harpy beast distracts them with its screams. The armored primitives all flee in terror, but Ashley Williams rises to the occasion, and with one quick blast from his boomstick, slays the evil airborne enemy who, uh, was definitely not on strings or anything. Ignore that. I ignore the strings. Naturally, this exhibition of firepower earns Ash the respect of everyone around him. Hail he who has come from the skies to deliver us! From the terrors of the dead eyes! The movie ends with game recognizing game, and everyone hailing Ash as a prophesized hero even as he screams no 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 into the sky. Not counting that winged beast because it's not humanoid and those are the arbitrary rules I follow. How many kills were in Evil Dead 2? Let's find out and get to the numbers. Groovy. I counted 8 kills and or possessions in Evil Dead 2. Okay, let's see here. One dude was possessed while alive, another dude was killed, one lady was possessed while alive, and another two ladies got killed. Finally, one male deadite was dismembered, and the same goes for two female deadites. Oh boy, Evil Dead, you're making a lot of work for my graphics person. Thanks, Clara. With a runtime of 84 minutes, we wound up with a killer possession on average every 10 and a half minutes. I'll give the golden chainsaw for coolest kill to Jake. Yeah, the details of what's happening are off screen, but I can't think of a better image to summarize the tone of this movie than Annie pulling at Jake's legs while she gets soaked with a geyser of blood. It's hilarious in that perfectly dark Evil Dead way. Doll Machete for Lamest Kill will go to Annie Noby for show, getting stabbed in the back by Ash's evil hand. Disembodied hands aren't supposed to kill you, they're supposed to get you drunk. And that's it. Evil Dead 2 came out in 1987, and is sometimes considered better than the original, even though for me, they're both equally great in different ways. Thanks again to Loofright for sponsoring this video and giving these awesome viewers an ad-free experience. Until next week, I'm James A. Janice. This has been The Kill Count. Hey everyone, thanks a lot for watching the latest Kill Count. And thanks again to Loofright for sponsoring this video. I think Loofright is a great idea from Loot Crate. Two years ago, I got their October Loot Crate, which had a whole bunch of horror stuff in it. It included that Friday the 13th pendant, and this little Leatherface plushie. He's been here the whole time. He's always been in the background. Also, thanks to my buddy Mark for lending me his chainsaw. All right, be groovy people.